بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Today we're going to look at chapter 7 of the reign of quantity and the signs of the times by René Guénon. Chapter 7 is entitled Uniformity Against Unity. I really see this as a further development and elaboration of the basic idea which was introduced in chapter 6 entitled The Principle of Individuation. I have in mind specifically the um, observation made by René Guénon that the modern world takes quantity as the principle of individua individuation and that if one then does this and takes this as the principle of individuation and differentiation this leads to nothing but multiplicity nothing but antagonism and the more <clears throat> that people are reduced to being mere ciphers so to speak mere units um, empty vessels as it were homogenized rendered all homogeneous as a mass through uh, modern <clears throat> propaganda and indoctrination they go in the direction of complete and total uniformity and uniformity is in no way to be confused with true unity this tendency as well is a manifestation of the overall entropic or degenerative process or processes of the Kali Yuga. The fundamental idea, the key in fact to chapter 7, uniformity against unity, it lies in the symbolic representation of manifestation, the cycle of manifestation in the symbolism of a triangle where we take principial unity or pure quality essential unity in other words to represent to be represented or symbolized by a dimensionless point which forms the apex the vertex the upper vertex the apex of a triangle and then issuing out from this singularity you have, of course, the two sides of the triangle. Let us say it's an isosceles triangle, meaning these two legs, those two sides are the same length. And then within you have a number of other legs forming an isosceles triangle, and the middle one would just be a vertical line. And then you have the base. The base would represent utter multiplicity and pure quantity. And you have to imagine those lines extending indefinitely when uh, they reach a point of maximum differentiation or indefinite atomic multiplicity. This is the image you must bear in your mind. So, again on begins the chapter by saying, if the domain of manifestation that constitutes our world is considered as a whole, it can be said that the existences contained therein, as they gradually move away from the principial unity become progressively less qualitative and more quantitative. Principial unity, which contains synthetically, not analytically, synthetically within itself all the qualitative determinations of the possibilities of this domain, is in fact its essential pole, whereas its substantial pole, which evidently must become nearer as the other becomes more remote, is represented by pure quantity with the indefinite atomic multiplicity it implies. Note he says indefinite, he doesn't say infinite. There's a very important distinction in René Guénon between the indefinite and the infinite. And for this, if you really want to understand what he's saying, you have to read his book, Metaphysical Principles of the Infinitesimal Calculus. <clears throat> With the indefinite atomic multiplicity it implies, uh, comma, and with the exclusion of any distinction between its elements other than the numerical. So this gradual movement away from essential unity can be envisaged from a twofold point of view. This is very important. It can be envisaged from a twofold point of view, namely that of simultaneity and that of succession. This means that it can be seen as simultaneous in the constitution of manifested beings, 
where its degrees determine for their constituent elements or for the corresponding modalities a sort of hierarchy or alternatively as successive in the very movement of the whole manifestation from the beginning to the end of a cycle. So obviously he's going to look at it from the point of view of succession. Now he introduces the symbolism of the triangle. He says, in all cases, however, the domain in question can be represented geometrically by a triangle of which the apex is the essential pole, which is pure quality, while the base is the substantial pole, which in our world is pure quantity. Symbolized by the multiplicity of the points comprised in the base and contrasted with a single point, which is the apex. Then he says that you know, if you imagine this triangle, and then he says that if you imagine that lines are drawn parallel to the base, those parallel lines, running parallel to the base again, will uh, symbolize or represent different degrees of remoteness from the apex. So if you bear that image in your mind, then you can see that um, the more, uh, the further you get away from the apex, the more quantity increases. And in fact, he says, you have to imagine that the base moves indefinitely far away, not infinitely, but in, in, indefinitely remote is the phrase, phrase he uses from the apex. Now, the domain of manifestation is in itself truly indefinite. There's any number of things that are found in our world. And, and moreover, um, the multiplicity of the points at the base, he says, can be brought to a maximum, if you envision this uh, symbol. And that indicates that the base, that is to say pure quantity, can in fact never be reached in the course of the development of manifestation. It only reaches a maximum. It will never reach pure quantity, pure unadulterated, so to speak, quantity. Although manifestation tends more and more toward it, it's sort of, you could think of it mathematically as it, it, it kind of asymptotically approaches or it reaches a maximum. Um, now that also means, he says, that if you go from below, <coughs> from the substantial pole then, if you move from below uh, a certain level, the apex, that is to say essential unity or pure quality, would be more or less lost to view. So imagine you're moving far, 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 far away from that apex, so to speak. And then that apex, then you can barely see it anymore. It becomes remote to view or almost lost to view. And he says this situation is precisely the existing condition of our world. So our world is characterized by more and more, by what, by more and more multiplicity and moving away from the apex and moving away from principial unity symbolized by the apex and that is indeed the character of the entropic or um, the entropic or, or uh, 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 processes of, uh, of degeneration of the Kali Yuga <clears throat> <clears throat> so earlier when he spoke about species understood in the modern sense as a mere conglomeration or collectivity consisting of just a whole bunch of different units. So units are only distinguished one, one from another numerically. Um, so quality is completely removed. It is clear that pure quantity is really and necessarily beneath all manifested existence. Okay. It is useful to recall here, this is page 50, he refers to Leibniz. Leibniz is a thinker whom uh, <clears throat> Genon seems to have engaged with quite a bit. It especially comes out in his book on the metaphysical principles of the infinitesimal calculus because Leibniz is one of the, considered anyway, to be one of the... Uh, discoverers or if you like inventors of calculus along with uh, Isaac Newton and he says that 
he says that it is useful to recall here what Leibniz referred to as the principle of indiscernibles, by which he meant that there cannot exist anywhere two identical beings. That is to say, two beings alike in every respect. As has been pointed out elsewhere, this is an immediate consequence of the limitlessness of universal possibility, which carries with it the absence of all repetition in particular possibilities. So this notion of the mo uh, that we find in the modern world of species or things being completely reduced to a certain uniformity is a metaphysical is a as, as a notion is a metaphysical impossibility because there is no repetition in the process of manifestation there's a saying among the sufis la takrara fit tajalli there is no repetition of divine manifestation and in the quran in surah ar-rahman which is the 55th chapter of the quran in the 29th verse it says and every day, so to speak, or every instance he is involved with some affair, and there's no repetition in those tajalliyat or in those um, acts of self-manifestation. Um, so yes, he does like um, Leibniz to some degree, and he thinks Leibniz uh, was quite correct in some instances, and at the same time he thinks that Leibniz also committed errors in other instances. Um, so Leibniz expresses this idea that, you know, there can't be two absolutely identical beings. And he expresses this idea also by saying that it is never true that two beings, wherever they may be, differ solo numero, in terms of number only or solely by number. And this, in its application to bodies, writes, again, overrides the mechanistic conceptions such as those of Descartes. And Leibniz goes on to say that if they did not differ qualitatively, they would not even be beings, but something like divisions exactly resembling each other of a homogeneous space and time. So you have to understand that Descartes, even though he made possible what is today known as analytic geometry, he conceives of an infinite space. And... <clears throat> So all points really are the same, but the, in, in point of fact, they actually are not. Because even for Descartes, you have to introduce a coordinate system. So if you just imagine a limitless expanse of space, and it doesn't matter where, you draw two perpendicular lines and extend each to infinity. We're speaking in modern mathematical language. Yeah. So you extend them both in both directions infinitely using the t language of modern mathematics and they're perpendicular that establishes a coordinate system and then you can draw another line perpendicular to that so you'd have a three-dimensional space and you could actually have an n-dimensional space but as soon as you impose a coordinate system some point p1 will be distinct from some other point p2 because point p1 will have its coordinates let's say x1 y1 and z1 or z1 if you like and then x2 y2 and z2 in other words each point in that space will be distinguished by a particular set of coordinates that measure their distance that measure the respective distances from the vertical the horizontal and um, the um, third dimension of, 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 of depth so there really is no such thing as a completely homogeneous space and the same applies to a completely homogeneous time if time is seen as some sort of a mathematical continuum on a line which of course for Genon it's not time is cyclical and in fact for Genon time is not even a circle it's actually a spiral because when you come to the end you don't come back to the exact same beginning you're you're on another level of, of manifestation so to, um, in the cycle um, and uh, again, on points it out, he says that Leibniz does not seem to have had an adequate idea of the nature of space and time. Um, Leibniz spoke of space. In fact, he defined it as an order of coexistence, and he defined time as an order of succession. Uh, but again, here, Genon points out that such definitions of the Leibnizian kind uh, only consider time and space from a purely logical point of view and thus they reduce them to homogeneous containers quite without quality and with no and so with no effective existence 
and he takes no account whatever of their ontological nature. That is to say, of the real nature of space and time as manifested in our world, wherein they really exist as conditions determining the special mode of existence distinguished as corporeal existence. So, uniformity is really a metaphysical absurdity. Yet, we live in an age of contradictions, and things are moving in that way. So the only way that uniformity can be imposed, Ingenon says, and even then it'll be a kind of falsehood, but it, it, metaphysically speaking, but it, it is part of the cyclical conditions, and so it will have its reality on its own level. So the conclusion, he says, that from all of you know what he's said so far, is that uniformity, this is page 51, in order that it may be possible presupposes beings deprived of all qualities and reduced to nothing more than simple numerical units. And in the case of human beings, that is being done, as I've said in my previous lecture on chapter 6, through a kind of imposition of, of a, a kind of atomization, a kind of in, uh, nurturing or manufacturing even of the vacuity, a systematic vacuity of the individual, a rendering of human beings as a mass, uh, a, a, as a homogeneous mass, a homogenization, if you like, an alchemical processing. Um, and so they're reduced to simple numerical units. And it's also possible, it, it can o so this uniformity can also only be made possible also if no such, sorry, um, let me rewind here just read what he actually says so the conclusion that emerges clearly from all this is that uniformity in order that it may be possible presupposes beings deprived of all qualities reduced to nothing more than simple numerical units and at this point i started saying all of my uh, what I, my uh, my my interpretation and then there's a semicolon here and genon continues also that no such uniformity is ever in fact realizable while the result of all the efforts made to realize it, notably in the human domain, can only be to rob beings more or less completely, more or less completely, of their proper qualities, thus turning them into something as nearly as possible like machines. This is important, and we read a, an important uh, and, and highly prophetic passage from the French thinker Jacques Ellul in the previous lecture, mm -hmm. when discussing Chapter Six. And machines, he goes on to say. The typical product of the modern world are the very things that represent in the highest degree attained up till now the predominance of quantity over quality. From a social viewpoint, democratic and egalitarian conceptions tend toward exactly the same end, for according to them all individuals are equivalent one to another. This idea carries with it the absurd supposition that everyone is equally well fitted for anything whatsoever. Though nature provides no examples of any such equality for the reasons already given, since it would imply nothing but a complete similitude between individuals, but it is obvious that in the name of this assumed equality, which is of the topsy turvy ideals most which is one of the topsy turvy ideals most dear to the modern world, individuals are in fact directed toward becoming as nearly alike one to another as nature allows. And this, in the first place, by the attempt to impose a uniform education on everyone. So this is a very long passage, but it's very important. Because on the one, you have many people today who quite rightly understand that uh, education, especially in the United States, the educational system curricula have been thoroughly uh, denuded of uh, substantial intellectual content what is often colloquially referred to as the dumbing down of the curriculum. Uh, many people are aware of this. Many people have remarked about the abandoning of the liberal arts, the study of the trivium and the quadrivium. But I think it's really only when you read Genon that you see where this is actually, what is truly at root of this problem. In other words, the 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 instilling of a uniformity against unity which again is part of the degenerative and entropic processes of the Kali Yuga 
Um, but it is in fact true. You, you do not have, it's just nowhere found in nature, and it's certainly true of human beings. Everyone is not equal in the same sense in the same subjects. Or, you know, in, in, even in the, in the domain of physical strength, you have some people who are, <clears throat> because of their biological makeup, their genetics, some will be more, will be able to run faster, or lift more, you know, given the same training regime and the same diet, for example. And so the same applies in the realm of education. People simply have different latent abilities, different potentialities. And modern education systems impose a kind of egalitarianism. And in my own lifetime, I've seen this, these curricula become more and more denuded of any genuine content. They become more and more, I mean, they're really tending toward in the direction of being completely useless now, where actual uh, subject matter is, is reduced and reduced, reduced further so that there's very little left. Mm. And most of these kids in school are just doing, especially in America, are just doing a bunch of busy work, even if they're in so-called honors, whatever. AP. AP. A lot of it is mm. just a bunch of ridiculous busy work. And then they have the notion of standardized testing. It doesn't measure anything. I really don't think and IQ tests. Another example yeah, of, of the it's all just a series of tricks. The madness of strategies. quantification. Yeah. Intelligence. Intelligence in what? It's it's notoriously hard to measure. And again, they're going in the direction of quantity. There's always quantitative metrics that they're looking for. So they'll do some sort of standardized test in such and such schools. Oh, these people scored this much. You know, let's let's give them more funding or something like this. Um, whereas a the traditional model of a liberal education in which the, the focus was on classical languages in Western civilization would have been Latin or Greek and Islamic would have been Arabic and Persian and the study of the grammar of that language of those languages and then the study of the rhetoric of those languages and then the study of logic in those languages and the Islamic civilization that would have been in Arabic could also have been in Persian but mainly Arabic and in, in Western civilization Latin really had the pride of place right at least in the Latin West. Um, <laughs> and uh, you don't have that anymore. And in that, every person can study. I mean, you, yeah, and, I, and, I and think, each person takes from it what they can get. Exactly. I think, I think in that sense, liberal uh, education is much more, quote-unquote, egalitarian or equal than so-called modern education mm -hmm. because it, it, it allows for the student to approach it the same subjects, yeah. but approach it in their own way and take what they feel is important to them according to whatever latent yes, they, they and make potentialities it their own. that they have. Yeah. Example, uh, you know... And in that sense, it like lives in your Like the Nicomachean Ethics, for example. That's a book everyone should read. Is it on the curriculum of, you know, whatever no. high school in this place or that place in America? And I can tell you from my own experience... Every person I've talked to about it, about uh, every person I've talked to who's read the book, mm -hmm. takes away something totally different totally than different. to me. But it it's just as useful to me mm -hmm. when I hear their interpretation as it is to them. That's the sign of a great book. And and I think that kind of education, it truly lives in your heart forever. You you do truly learn it, as opposed to just memorizing, which is modern education. Yeah, I mean they just bring in these books. I, do, I personally, I don't think that uh, Animal Farm or, you know, Fahrenheit 451 or The Lord of the Flies are necessarily bad novels. I mean, for, those are actual books on, on, you'd be lucky on, to a, find on a, a number of reading lists, right? I don't even know if they still do that. Yeah, you'd be lucky to find a school that still reads that. Really? I think so, yeah. I also I heard some years back that, that one of the uh, books on a reading list in one of the local schools here uh, for so-called English literature was um, Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. Now, I've never read that. I, I, at the time when it became a real big thing, I would see it a lot in airports because I used to travel a lot yeah. in those days, but I never bothered to read it. Um, so again, one doesn't want to be unfair to a modern author, but... In all frankness, it says residues. If you spent it's residues. If you spend more time, your time would be better spent reading an ancient author. I mean, for example, the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, even Homer, or the Homer, if you or want fiction, Cicero, yeah, Shakespeare, for that matter. Yeah, 
but these books take a certain amount of effort and um, you know, it's just been all removed from the curriculum and we've already spoken about logic and so forth so not to spend too much time on this I think we've made the point um, some other interesting quotes um, from from uh, this chapter on page uh, 52 uh, end of 51 on the way to 52 um, he says that it's it is no less obvious that differences of aptitude cannot in spite of everything be entirely suppressed yeah so that a uniform education will not give exactly the same results for all so even with this this horrible denuded curriculum that we find throughout the unit in well denuded curricula in different localities in the united states it really leads nowhere but it is all too true that although it cannot confer on anyone qualities that he does not possess, it is, on the contrary, very well fitted to suppress in everyone all possibilities above the common level. And so the uniformity that they're imposing, the leveling, is always working downward. Indeed, it could not work in any other way, being itself only an expression of the tendency toward the lowest that is toward pure quantity again remember the triangle symbol yeah. situated as it is at a level lower than that of all corporeal manifestation so further down on page 52 he says something very nice and, and he had said earlier in the book about how no matter what happens in the Kali Yuga these degenerative processes really began in the west and even though they've taken, they've been, they've the been they've the sent Occident. all, all, yeah. all over the place. They've gone to every four, all the four corners of the earth. In the eastern lands, it will always remain a westernization. Yeah. So he has an interesting thing to say here on this westernization. He says the modern westerner is moreover not content only to impose an education of that sort at home. He also wants to impose it on other peoples, together with the whole gamut of his own mental and bodily habits so as to make all the world uniform, while at the same time he imposes uniformity on the outward aspect of the world by the diffusion of the products of his industry. So this is mass, um, what's it called? Mass production. Mass production. And this um, presages what he uh, discusses at great length in the next chapter, next chapter, chapter eight, which is ancient crafts and modern industry. And he says this leads to a kind of parody. Now, by parody, he means that uniformity is actually a parody of unity. And a lot of what we see in the Kali Yuga is a parody. Uh, so, so secular ideologies become a parody of religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they become almost what I call a, a faith of unbelief. And, you know, if you, if you say something against some of the great prophets or saints of uh, these secular ideologies, for example, if you were to, let's say, trash Marx mm -hmm. or Freud or Derrida or Foucault, these are more modern, more recent names. Sartre. Or Sartre. Yeah. Um, especially in the modern university context. That's almost a blasphemy. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. Yes. Yeah. But it's no problem if you just make, uh, you know, Offensive cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad or if you take a, a crucifix sacred symbol of, of the Christian religion and put it in a bottle of urine and take a picture of it and call it piss Christ I'm not making that up if you mm -hmm. google that you'll find that that was an actual work of modern art mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> what's that um documentary BBC documentary with Roger oh, Scruton Roger Scruton I don't remember about the art name. Why don't, why don't you search it right now? And remember, there was someone who actually signed, a, he put his signature on a toilet seat on or a, something? On yeah, a facetious like pseudonym, R. Mutt, on yeah, the urinal. Yeah, and it became a work of art. And his whole commentary was against modern art, but it became a... Well, magnable. you take some some aspect of modern, you know, industrial... Why life beauty matters. You make a, that's what a, it's a painting of a can of soup, and that's a work of art. Yeah, there was also... Uh, why beauty matters. Why beauty matters. Yeah, that's, that's a really good... There's also the, the probably the worst but funniest example is um, this is the actual name of it the can of shit. 
Yeah, that's the thing. That do you remember? Do you remember that most recent one with the when they taped a banana to a wall? That's right. They taped a banana to a wall. And somebody, it sold for like ten thousand dollars or something. Wallahi nas majani, crazy people. Imagine him. Yeah. Okay, how did we get on this? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Oh, you, we, were we, we were talking about, about parodies. Yeah, parody. And so, uh, uniformity is a parody of unity. So he says, in fact, the imposition of uniformity, while actually leading in a direction exactly opposite to that of true unity, since it tends to realize that which is most remote therefrom, takes shape as a sort of caricature of unity. And it does so because of the analogical relation, whereby, as was pointed out ever, very early in this book, unity itself is inversely reflected in the units that constitute pure quantity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so also with this tendency toward uniformity on page 53, Ganon talks about how this also uh, leads towards more and more artificiality. He says for this, you know, this artificiality, for this is the very result that these modifications are calculated to produce. Since all their activity, the activity of modern people, is directed toward a domain as strictly quantitative as possible. Now here he has a couple of things to say about science. He says, besides, as soon as the desire to produce a purely quantitative science arose, it became inevitable that the practical application derived from that science should share its character. Now he's obviously going in the direction of technology, but specifically in the direction of, you know, modern industry, manufacturing, and so on. These applications as a whole are generally designed, sorry, are generally designated by the name of industry, and modern industry can be said to represent from all points of view the triumph of quantity because its operations do not demand any knowledge other than quantitative and because the instruments of which it makes use, that is to say machines, properly so called, are developed in such a way that qualitative considerations come in to the least possible extent, while the men who work them are themselves limited to an activity of an entirely mechanical kind. Quality also being completely sacrificed to quantity in the actual products of industry. So you think of a factory worker yeah. that's just doing some sort of mindless, repetitive menial task, task, menial task, and now they're going to be even getting rid of these people with yeah. artificial intelligence and robots. robots. And so this is the direction. Self-driving trucks. And good luck with that. So this is the direction these things are moving. Yeah. Um, now there's a final kind of cryptic remark that he makes and we just need to call attention to that and then we'll conclude this uh, discussion of this chapter yeah he says a few more observations can use be made in order to cover the subject all right but he's not gonna he's, he's gonna do that in the next chapter and he says before proceeding with them a question which will be returned to later may be interpolated what's that question He says, whatever may be thought of about the value of the results of the action that modern man applies to the world, it is a fact, independently of any estimation of values, that this action succeeds. I need to pause and take that in for a moment. Comma, and that at least to a certain extent, comma, it reaches the ends at which it aims, semicolon, if the men of another period had acted in the same way. Now leave out the parenthetical read on if the men of another period had acted in the same way would the results have been the same Hmm. in the parenthetical he's just saying this is a totally hypothetical question right so then he says he continues after the question mark in other words in order that the terrestrial environment may be suitable for such action must it not be in some way predisposed thereto by the cosmic conditions of the cyclical period in which we now are then there's a semicolon so he's saying that he doesn't use the word technology, but I, th- I think that that's what is meant here. In other words, the action, the application, in other words, of modern quantitative science has resulted in a very materially successful and efficacious technology industry, right? So this efficaciousness of this kind of action, can it be attributed to the cyclical conditions in which we live? And 
his answer, his view is yes. So after the semicolon, uh, let's take a period in which we now are semicolon. That is, turn the page, page 54. That is, must there not be something in that environment which, with reference to earlier periods, has undergone a change? It would be premature to go fully into the nature of that change at this point, or to do more than characterize it as being necessarily of the nature of a qualitative diminution. Allowing a firmer hold to everything that springs from quantity. That's the, that's the only real point. Or at least for the moment, that's as far as he wants to take it. And so this chapter comes full circle because that's where he started. Mm -hmm. He said that in the domain of manifestation, as we move further and further, so to speak, away from the principial unity, quality decreases and quantity increases. So in other words, with the uh, passage of time, and the increase in entropy and in the degenerative processes of the Kali Yuga, quantitative means become more efficacious. And it would appear that his, the implication here is that his contention is that in previous times they wouldn't have been. Wallahu alam, and Allah knows best. But that's what he is saying here. And that is the thought that he wants to conclude the chapter with. So he says it would be premature to fully go into the nature of that change or to do more than characterize it being necessary the nature of the qualitative diminution, allowing a firmer hold to everything that springs from quantity. Then there's a semicolon. He loves these long sentences. I suppose you can do this easily in French. Yeah. Semicolon. But what has been said about the qualitative determinations of time at least makes the possibility of a change of this kind conceivable. So in other words, he's saying that the, the, the point he's trying to make it's not really as outlandish as it may seem at first blush, especially if you've come this far with him, and renders understandable the idea that the artificial modifications of the world, again through technology, in order that they may come about, must presuppose natural modifications, that is to say in the cyclical conditions in which we live, to which they merely correspond or conform in one way or another by virtue of the correlation that invariably exists in the cyclical movement of time between the cosmic order and the human order. So if you go slowly and think about these things, and if you take the time to sort of go and do some background reading in philosophy and scholastic philosophy, logic, and so forth, and mind you, that is a, a steep learning curve, but I think that's the point of these lectures that I'm doing. I'm trying to help out anyone who really wants to uh, read Genon, and hopefully people who, who uh, come at this with the sincerity and intention to actually learn, uh, maybe I can, through these lectures, uh, ease that, that uh, transition and that burden, uh, that learning curve. And uh, if um, these uh, video lectures uh, succeed in that regard, um, inshallah, then I will be... Uh, that would be more than adequate repayment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so he sort of sums up that point about this peculiar cyclical conditions, and now he will turn further to this idea of, of uniformity versus unity because we have that in the products of modern industry, mass production of things, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in previous times, even something, even, even our clothes are mass produced, really. Yeah. You know, in previous times, people would go, they would select uh, some sort of textile, some sort of fabrics. They would go to a tailor, and the tailor would be really, really good. It was very personal. And, those, yeah. and it was very personal. And those clothes would last for a very long time. A very long time. Um, as would other, you know, objects and goods that would be used by people. And now these objects, which were <laughs> items of day-to-day -day use, let's say in the Islamic world, now sit in museums. Yeah. It's just astonishing. Absolutely astonishing what has happened. Uh, we even have some textiles, some you know ancient te uh, textiles from previous period. They're very, very different. And you know, in some parts of the world, you can you can still do this to some extent. In India, for example, yeah, some of the people still, still go to tailors, but but where's the difference? There's hand embroidery, yeah. but the cloth is mass produced. Mass produced, yeah. yeah. Even in the Western world, there's bespoke tailors. But, but all the, the all cloth the, 
all the it's stuff mass produced. I once was, I didn't buy it. I really regret it now. I was once, I once learned about, there's um, uh, a company in Japan, in Kyoto. In fact, I've been to their store mm -hmm. that sells, you know, uh, really um, high end, high quality Japanese martial arts gear. Okay. So there was a uh, Kaikogi, a training vest that had been made for Aikido, but you could wear it for Kendo as well, except in Kendo you usually wear blue and this was white, <laughs> but it was hand woven and hand stitched. Um, the price was kind of steep, but I, I never got it. But my Kendo stuff is all hand dyed. Aizomei, like one town in Japan. Okay. And then, you know, all of my um, wooden training swords are all hand. But the thing is, they, aren't, they weren't hand carved. They were hand turned on a lathe. So you yeah. still have that. But each one is... Because I had a friend of mine, when we bought them all together, there no two pieces are exactly the same. Yeah. No no two beings exactly alike. No two beings exactly alike. My Iaito, my, my training sword for, for is is um, custom made. But this is now more increasingly you know, everybody has the same Toyota and the same Honda, even even the high end cars. Yeah. You know, one Maserati, you know, unless you unless you have a huge amount of money and you go go get a completely custom made Tesla or whatever it is, high end car. But this is not just happening to clothes and things that you craft. I was talking Everything. with my friends the other day, and he was saying, you know, I think like every song nowadays sounds the same. Every movie oh, I looks the same. Songs, every yeah. Yeah. every he's saying every movie looks the same. Every everything just is the same now. That 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 was his feeling. That everything he looked at, every all the media he consumed, mm. was all just uniform it was all the same so i don't think it's just crafts anymore i think it's extended itself to everything really yeah well, well people also kind of run out of ideas and they steal stuff they you know one thing works really well and then they just change it a little they bit they hop on trends they they just well, like what was that movie um, hunger games yeah right and then there was like a clone of that what was that called divergent divergent yeah it was the big young adult craze and yeah but again they just they find what works and they, they don't want to, they never want to change it. Ever. Well, you're going to start talking about movies. That's why the new Star Wars is so awful. <laughs> no kidding. Because <laughs> it's all just uniformity. It's all just uniformity. Disney. <laughs> right. Okay, I think we're yeah. more or less done now. Uh, so the next chapter will be on. Um, yeah, we'll further develop these themes. So again, to just sum up, uh, to to navigate this chapter, you should keep that symbol of the triangle in your mind as you read through this. In fact, maybe, maybe even make a sketch. I think it's also important as you read to uh, to make, take notes. Don't do them on a on a laptop or some sort of device. That's another problem. You know, get get pen and paper or pencil and paper if you like you get a actual notebook not a laptop notebook a real notebook and take down notes write down passages that uh, strike you you know verbatim write them down that helps to assimilate the information Genon likes to use mathematical symbolism he was a mathematician so he's got this triangle example he has other examples like that in his other writings it always helps to to write those down uh, look things up um, uh, I've already mentioned, I think, my uh, logic reading list. Uh, so he does assume a lot of times that you have some notion or some acquaintance or familiarity with logic. So refer to that list. And uh, please do share this video. Like, subscribe, uh, take a look at my Patreon. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next lecture.